Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. This is the inaugural show of Off the Grid with Sarah Overall. And I am really excited about this program. And my guest this morning is David Jordan, and I am thrilled that you are here. And uh, I got to meet you for the first time this morning, David. I, we have mutual I friends, and uh, I followed you on Facebook, not like in a stalking way or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> but I've been uh, I've been noticing your uh, your your what you do and, and your passion for veterans, and it really is nice to nice to follow you and and see what you do and. Um, and you're, it's just, you've been doing some great things. And so um, I appreciate you accepting my invitation to be here. And well, I appreciate you bringing me here. You know, it's always nice when I get to talk to people that I've associated with on Facebook and get to meet them in person and put a face to the name. Because, well, I mean, I see your pictures and stuff on Facebook, but it's a lot different when you get to actually meet mm -hmm. the person that you've been associating with through social media because right. you don't always get to do that yeah and social media is a weird thing i i've almost walked from it so many times it's it's just a weird thing i, I get reluctant to even venture on it uh often but yet we're a great example i think today uh because we've been able to link up um, especially with with our shared um, passion to help our veterans David, tell us about what you do um, and what and why you serve the homeless in particular, homeless veterans. Well, I served my country for about 12 years between National Guard and active duty time. And back in 2014, going into 2015, I was actually homeless myself. And I was in a homeless shelter in Lexington, Kentucky. And the shelter I was in, there was 90 other homeless veterans there. All of them struggling, trying to make something of themselves, but not really having the help they needed because there's only one veteran coordinator at the shelters. And one person can't help 90 people. No, it's impossible. No. And you hear the desperation in people's voices. You hear the, the sorrow in their stories. And you hear some of the things that these guys have been through. And it just, it wretches at your heartstrings. It just tears at you. Mm -hmm. And seeing the guys in one shelter and the only time they get to see their wives and children is at meal times it's it's disheartening why is that only at meal times because they're in different shelters men are in one shelter women and children are in a different shelter a lot of times really now i've noticed here in dallas that a lot of the shelters actually try and keep the families together which is really good to see but i mean there's 32 homeless shelters here in dallas and not all of them have programs to help veterans. Mm -hmm. And even with that, the resources at the shelters are limited. They'll help people get food, they'll help people get clothing, they'll help them find jobs, but they don't necessarily take them through the full transitional program that these guys need to be able to go back out into society and function. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was homeless, I went to 17 job interviews and got turned down. I mean, I've got 25 years of management experience. I've got 30 years of customer service experience. I'm a certified Army instructor. I mean, I've trained on how to develop training curriculum for our soldiers who are going overseas. Do you think that that has a lot to do with the stereotyping? Oh, he's, he's, he's not normal, or he's, he's, he might pop off someday at work, or the sort of stereotype that people have that the, 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 the quote, the veteran is not stable. and. Do you think you know, that has something to do I, with that? I think that has something to do with it, but I think also the stigma that because they're homeless, they're worthless is another really big issue. Because with all my experience, I had people love me throughout the interview, but then, as you know, in an interview, the first part of it's about the job, and then the second part of it about it is you as a person. Right. They would see my address, and they would know that it was a homeless shelter. Wow. And as soon as they saw that, that's when their demeanor toward me changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People didn't want to give me a chance because they were homeless. Wow. Is what it ended up making me feel like. Whether that was actually, you know, the actuality of it or not, I don't know. I can't see what's going through those people's minds. Mm -hmm. But I know when I'm talking to you and we're having an interview, and all of a sudden you go from being all happy about me coming to work for you to, oh, you're homeless? It really just kind of, it, it shows you where their mindset went. Right, right. 
And the whole focus of We Got Your Six is to be a full-blown transitional program to take these guys from ground zero to being able to reintegrate back into society and have a chance at survival. Right. And and that's the name of your organization, correct? Yes. Right. And when we, I can't, I have to thank my business partner Angie for coming up with that name. She was actually the one who named it. And I started doing research on what the name actually meant because in the military, you know, we got your six means we got your back. But I wanted to know where that term came from. And lo and behold, it came from the Navy. It was coined by the World War II Naval fighter pilots. Because when you're up in the air, you don't have topographical landmarks for positioning. So they used the position of a clock, six o'clock being directly behind you. So that, nice. that term later on became an infantry tactic, meaning we've got your back, we've got your six. So the name just seemed fitting. Mm -hmm. I love it. And that's exactly what we do. We, we take these guys, we're gonna be building three facilities here in Texas. One in Dallas, one in San Antonio, and one in Houston. And we're gonna be pulling the homeless veterans that wanna be part of our program out of the shelters, off the streets, and bringing them out to these ranch facilities where they're gonna be planting, harvesting, and growing their own food. They're gonna be responsible for all the repairs, maintenance, upkeep, taking care of the livestock, taking people on trail rides. Wow, that's great. And the great thing about it is all the food that we grow on our property helps us become self-sufficient and self-sustaining. It gives these guys something to wake up for every morning. Mm -hmm. It gives them a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment and they've got a sense of purpose again. And you know what else you're providing? It's nutritious, mm -hmm. right? What I've found with veterans, you know, you, you've, got, you've got men and women that go in and, and they're fit and, and they're used to, used to being fit and, and there's a requirement with that. Mm -hmm. you, they come home and then they, they, they don't get the same physical activity. There's a weight gain uh, that, that goes along with, with being stagnant when they get home. That, that all aligns with depression. Uh, that depression fits in with, with self-medicating and all oh, yeah. of that just feeds and feeds and compounds the additional problems. And um, that's great. They'll be outside. They've mm -hmm. got open air. That you know, being well, being put into a VA hospital often, they're they're just cloistered in, in a building. This is beautiful. I love well, it. Well, and something else. Okay, a lot of these guys, if they do have work, they go out to work and they're out around other people and they're interacting and they're not in a negative environment. Right. Because shelters are, I hate to say it, but shelters are a negative environment. Well, you because feel all these like people, you're failing somehow. You feel like you're, you've somehow failed your family or or yourself. Yourself. Or, right? but you're going and you have all these people who can't work or they can't get anything. They can't do this. They can't do that. That negativity just surrounds you. So even if you go out to work and you're having a great day, and you're doing something productive. You're making money. You're going back into a negative environment. So you've actually gone from negative to positive to negative, which actually can take you further back from where you were when you left that day. So we take them out of that environment. They live on our properties. We're gonna be building barracks where we're gonna be able to house 100 men and 100 women. And we're actually gonna have some trailers for people that have families. Mm -hmm. So the families can be separated and have their family time. Wow. So, they're on our property, so we're con posit continuously feeding positive energy into the program and positive energy into the veterans that we're working with. And we're actually gonna have three or four residential trailers where I, you, we wanna try and get the families involved with these guys, because a lot of times their families, once they become homeless, they don't want anything to do with them. They don't want that stigma attached to their family. Right, right. So, like, Say you're my say you're my veteran. Mm -hmm. I would say. So, do you have a veteran? Do you have a family member that you would like me to reach out to and try and get involved with your with your rehabilitation and your process? If they say yes, do you have a name and number and or email address where I can reach out to them? We will reach out to that family members. You know, to those family members and say, hey, I've got Sarah here in my program and we're really trying to help get her back on her feet and get her started in a positive direction. And it would be really, really advantageous 
if you could come out and spend some time with her on our property and help with that process. Excellent. You can stay on our property free of charge. We'll help you with getting out here. You can stay here, eat with us, you know, spend time with your veteran. The, the trailer that you'll be staying in will be your safe haven. The veteran will not be able to go there. Mm-hmm. That is your spot to decompress. Later on, if you want the veteran to be able to go there, you'll have to sign a waiver saying, yes, the veteran can come over here, so you're releasing us from liability. Mm-hmm. But we want you to come out and help them. Now, that's a catch-22 to this process. If we get a hold of the family member and they say no, we're not going to tell the veteran. We're going to tell the veteran that, hey, we haven't been able to get a hold of them yet, but we have their contact information. So what we're going to do is we'll send progress reports about how the family member's doing, about how the veteran's doing. Wow, that's and clever. And hoping, hoping that once the family member sees, okay, well, they're making genuine progress. Yeah, we want to come out now. Then we'll say, hey, guess what? Sarah, I was able to get a hold of your family member. And guess what? They're coming out to see you. That's great. I like that. So the family member, if we get a hold of the family member, they say no, we don't tell the veteran because we don't want the veteran going, well, I don't have anybody having, you know, supporting me other than us. Because then that way they don't have a rejection. That's exactly. great. Exactly. And then we get that family member out to the property, we get him involved, and hopefully that's an additional kickstart to that veteran's rehabilitation. Because now they know they've got their family behind them, and that's what a lot of these guys need. That's right. That's I mean, right. last last year there was, I want to say there was 30 or 40 funerals for veterans, homeless veterans. And the only people that attended those funerals were the Patriot Guard mm-hmm. or the people conducting the funeral services. Right. It should never be like that. And sometimes they're burying six in a, at a time. Yeah. Those homeless, some of those homeless services, they're, they're, I, I've been there as five, six at, at a time. Yeah. It's like, how is this possible? Well, there's a number that I'll throw out here. A lot of people have probably heard of this group called 22 Kill. Yeah. And I know the the guys from 22 Kill personally. But 22 Kill represents the fact that 22 veterans kill themselves every single day. They lose their battle to PTSD, depression, and in fact, I lost a very good friend of mine earlier this year. Are you talking about Jackal? Jackal. Right. Yeah. That was yeah. a big hit. Yeah. That I knew, I knew Jackal. Shock. In fact, Jackal helped me um, revamp a little bit of things on my website when he took a look at it. And he's like, why don't you do this, this, and this differently? And I made those changes. Yeah. He was an and ambassador, an ambassador to try to stop others from taking their lives. And then he couldn't stop himself. It yeah. was a huge Stephen Jackal. It was. It was. A big loss. And you know what? I have to give it out. I have to give a, give a big thank you out to Addie. Oh, um, yeah. Bless I, her You know, I, I have not had a chance to meet you personally, but Addie, you've been an inspiration and support. And Addie, I have a special section on my website called the Memorial Wall. And on the Memorial Wall, Memorial Wall are the names of those soldiers who are no longer with us. And Stephen Jackal is actually on my website. As Eddie is his wife and the mother of six. They, they, there were six children left behind. Yeah. So she gave me, I reached, I waited for a little while after the funeral and I reached out to her. She, we contacted on th- Facebook and she sent me a good picture of Jackal. And Jackal is on my website, on the honor wall, as well as Ben Adams, who is also another advocate for 22 Kill, uh, Sean Ranger Smurf Riley. Um, my uncle, uh, Stephen Jordan, is on there. Um, he served during Vietnam in the Navy. But we also, I mean, I've got probably about 30 or 40 names on this wall. And I saw that on and Facebook, too. you actually have the option of playing taps while you're viewing the names on my website, if you want, for people oh, who want I that sovereignness. That. Wow. Yeah, if you pull up my website, at the very top it says taps, and you can, it says click here to hear taps, because some people don't want to hear it. Right, right. But you can click on taps, and you can actually listen to taps while you're scrolling through the names. And that's our way of keeping the memory of those soldiers alive. Mm -hmm. They live on through the work that We Got Your Six does for the veteran community. And each facility that we build is going to have a marble wall erected that will have all of those names transferred to it with a U.S. flag, a branch flag, and a spot for flowers so that people can place flowers for those soldiers. That's beautiful. And I'd like to say something to Addie, too. Addie, you beautiful, beautiful soul. 
and uh, we're here for you. We really are, and um, you've just you've done everything in just such grace and dignity, and and you are loved. And an additional thought to Rita. Rita, um, that's that's Stephen's mom. She was graciously. Um, kind enough to accept a, a private message conversation with me. We've had several now on, on private messenger. That's Stephen's mom and um, uh, as a mother, and she's a grandmother, I'm a mother and a grandmother of a two-year-old uh, grandson. And um, we've, uh, we've shared some conversations on, on messenger and I hope to meet her soon in person myself and uh, to the entire family. Um, just uh, you're, you're loved and you're and you're cared for and you're in a lot of people's prayers as well so just want to say that too and I'm honored that you guys allowed me the to put Jackal on there and I promise that we will keep his memory alive through the work that we do he will never ever be forgotten we'll have his six just like we'll have yours mm -hmm. and and the children they're there's wonderful wonderful children so um, I, I think our job here is to carry on his work because his work was to truly fill, fulfill the job of ambassador. His, his goal was to stop people from from not being able to fight this this awful thing, you know. And and he just couldn't do it at the end. And um, and I think we, we need to carry on that fight. That's what we're here to do. And you know, like I was starting to say, is out of those twenty two people don't realize how many of those are homeless veterans who gave up. Yeah. And I know that because I was almost there. February of 2014, excuse me, February of 2015, I almost took my own life. I was homeless, couldn't get a job. Nobody wanted to give me a chance. And I was at the bottom. And I got on Facebook and I had said goodbye to people and I went into the shelter and I took all my belongings and gave them away. And only reason I'm still here today is because my cousin saw my Facebook post. Really? And he reached out to me and he said, why don't you come out here to Texas? I'm like, no, I don't need to be a burden on anybody. I found a good solution. He's like, just come out here to Texas. So my cousin bought a ticket for me on Valentine for Valentine's Day 2015 and brought me out here to Texas. Wow. I was living with him and his girlfriend, who's now his wife, in Pasadena, Texas. And there was a trucking company right around, right out the back of their apartment complex. And I had my CDL, and I had been driving flatbed. And I had a job. And I met my business partner, Angie, through a social media site. And she was a medic in the Army, too, 10 years. And we just started talking, and she noticed that something was still off with me and she goes what's going on man and I'm like I don't know I just I feel like I'm meant for something more than just driving a stupid truck I mean don't get me wrong truck drivers I got <laughs> nothing but props and nothing but respect for you guys yeah. but I mean I I was spared for something mm -hmm. so we started talking about what I'd rather be doing and I told her my idea, which is what we're doing now, but it was originally targeted for troubled youths. And she goes, do you really want to take on that kind of responsibility and liability? I mean, that's a lot to take on. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I need to do something more with my life. And she goes, well, have you ever thought of doing something for the homeless veterans? I mean, look at everything you went through. Look at the point that you got to of almost killing yourself. So I started looking at the numbers and honestly, I was, I got sick to my stomach at the numbers. It made me want to throw up. I looked at the national numbers because there's a survey that was created back in 1994 by the Department of Veteran Affairs. It's called the Challenge Survey. And the sur Challenge Survey actually tracks the homeless veteran problem. And, you know, honestly, it's probably a lot worse than people could even imagine. That's what they say. But the challenge survey stands for Community Homelessness Assessment Local Education and Network Groups. And it's comprised of people who work for the VA, providers, volunteers, some local business owners, as well as homeless veterans themselves. And I have the statistics all the way back to 2013. And I'm going to give you a sad 
disgusting statistic. Do you want to know what the highest age group is? Yeah, tell me. 45 to 60. Wow. That has been the highest age group the last four years. Now, they do the survey every year, and I get the numbers every year. The, the survey usually comes around, around the of end of May, anywhere between the end of May to beginning of July. And I contact my person at the VA, and she sends me the, the report. And I put the statistics on my website. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't have the 2016 numbers on there because I've been having trouble with the logarithm trying to actually print and get into my computer. But I do have the numbers from 2014 and 2015 on here. And males, males in 2014, males made up 89.6%. Females made up 10.4%. Highest race group was white by... Males, 53.1%. African-American, 39.3%. Females was 45.9% and 47.2%. Highest age group, 45 to 60 at 50.9% for females and 61.1% for males. And I'm hearing also that we're having a new rise in a demographic group, and that's ages 19 to 36, some say 19 to 26, which is telling us that one tour, one tour even at the age of 19, and we're losing them to suicide as well. And that we're also having a huge hit with our U.S. Marine Corps in particular. Have you seen anything on that? Well, to cover the first part, for under 25... It's one point, in 2015, it was 1.6% and 0.9%. That number did jump up to the 2% and 3%. So their numbers are on the rise. Mm -hmm. But I do have to give it up to the VA and the, the counselors now. They've got things they can do for PTSD that they didn't have mm -hmm. prior. I mean, for the longest time, PTSD was not even recognized as a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know how to cope with it. So people got discharged from the military for other than medical purposes because P P PTSD wasn't a clinical diagnosis like it is now. Well, they were, they were dealing with, uh, it stuck back, the, the original diagnosis that was, that was d dealt with since the 19... 60s and 70s during the Vietnam War era they're they're finally beginning to modernize that and also too um, the TBI research has helped a lot too I I, I should say you know there, there's been a lot of good work there oh yeah um, and so that's helped too I think I think so too um, another statistic I was going to throw uh, was okay on my ch on my charts you'll have Literally homeless, emergency housing, transitional housing, permanent subsidized housing, and unsubsidized housing. The numbers for the literally homeless. Now, literally homeless is classified as sleeping in their car, couch surfing. Mm, that's how I've heard that new term. Tent, I didn't know that before. Um, yeah. Tent city and, you know, bouncing around from everywhere. 27.8% mm -hmm. for females, 28.6% for males are literally homeless. Now, people ask me, well, what's that breakdown by city to city? I'm like, that's actually harder to track because they get run out of the cities. You know, Dallas will run them out to Farmer's Branch. Farmer's Branch will run them into Carrollton. Carrollton will run them over to Plano or, you know, what other mm -hmm. neighboring cities they've got. So these guys are always roving from place to place. Mm -hmm. You know, they get a little bit of money and they get one of those debit cards and they get a bike and they bike to another city. Wow. So, but I do know for a fact that in 2015, Dallas and Collin County had 1,800 homeless veterans on record. That's on record. On record. Who knows how many not on record. And that number jumped up to 2,300 in 16. Or excuse me, 16 of his 1,800 jumped up in 17. That's startling. But we're still, you know, we're still trying to get all the numbers. I re I'll reach out to the different cities and because it's all public record. 
you can actually go through the public record section of Frisco, Colony, Plano, Carrollton, McKinney, and you can go through the request of public records of the number of homeless. And then you can actually try and they'll do it by veteran as well. And I put a posting out the other day on Facebook. I'm not sure if you saw this with that pie chart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. And on that pie chart, those are that's actually statistics that I nationwide statistics that I found. And somebody asked me. Um, so on that pie chart, it's got 47 percent homeless veterans were Vietnam War vets. 30 percent homeless Iraq and Afghanistan vets. Homeless vets for pre-Vietnam was 15%, and homeless veterans from other conflicts was only 8%. But that tells you that Vietnam era and that Iraq era were substantially impacting on people. Here's a question for you. Well, first of all, tell us this. Tell us what is your website address so listeners can find you. The website address is www.wgy, the number 6, Dot org. Okay, so they can find you there and mm -hmm. get involved, and in, and there's opportunities there to get involved as volunteerism. Or volunteerism. What? We're always looking for donations. Obviously, we, we we need monetary donations to help with some of the programs that we have going on. But clothing, mm -hmm. I've got a I've got a five by five storage unit where I've had people donate pots and pans that you know Operation Rock the Troops and Mark Warner and Joe Zaragoza did a huge benefit back in December for us, where we collected a bunch of stuff that filled up a 5x5 five five storage That's unit. That's a great organization, too. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got pots and pan sets. I've got bedding sets. I've got towels. I've got glasses. I've got all kinds of Could things. Could you use donated um, storage units? Donated storage units are always great. Okay. Uh, but land, and land, uh, for, land to fulfill would, your dream. You know, I land mean, would be beneficial. And, you know, one of the big programs we just launched that we need a lot of financial support for as well as equine support. Oh, we, yeah. We call it our Four-Legged Healers for Heroes program. And it's an equine therapy program based out of Oak Point Ranch out in Plano, Texas. And Rosie has been really big on helping us with this organization and with this new program. And she actually donated some of her own horses to the program. And we just had three draft horses donated from a veteran in Oklahoma. Wow. <laughs> so great. Um, wow. The, the Four-Legged Healers for Heroes program is not only an equine therapy program, but we named it that because we want to eventually get into doing service dogs mm -hmm. so that we can train service dogs to go with our veterans when they need them. So that program, I mean, that program estimately costs us anywhere from twenty to a twenty, twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a month because we got to feed the horses, the equine therapy, you know, the equine therapy, the the food, the grain, the vet care, uh -huh. uh, you know, taking care of the ranch hands and stuff. I mean, it gets costly. Wow, I wonder if you could do a combo of where you're going to have where you're going to have house your veterans and have the horses there. I, I mean, the interaction of the horses with that the is housed vets. That is going to be the ultimate goal. Yeah, you know, we, Rosie was nice enough to donate her facility for now until we can get our own property and get our own property up and running. But that is actually we want to have property that can be twenty to thirty acres. Mm -hmm where we can have access to riding trails and stuff like that. Then the vets could also care for the horses and do the feedings. And well, that's part yeah. of the program. Wow. They will be responsible for taking care of the equine. Mm -hmm. Like I have a property right now that I'm looking at in Nevada, Texas. It's only 29 acres, but it's $525,000. It's already got, it's got about a, I want to say it's got about an acre to two acre lake on it. So these guys can go fishing. We can have fishing competitions. We can do shooting competitions over the lake, so there's another fundraiser. We can build the barracks up on it. We can build a 30-stall 30 uh, stall barn, and we can keep you know 10 to 15 of our own horses in there, as well as out in pasture. But we can also rent the, sto the other stables out. Our veterans can take care of those horses. And Have you thought about the cost-effectiveness instead of the barracks of these little, these little tiny houses they do now? Well... I have, but the thing is, with the barracks, we can house more. 
Okay, okay. Spa well, you've got a communal type space, of living that's space, of, space and, efficiency. Okay. Because see, with the even though they're barracks, we can do them like soldier, soldier, single soldier barracks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they have a, a one bedroom, basically what equates to a one bedroom apartment. Yeah. A common shower area mm -hmm. and a common kitchen area. But they have they can have a refrigerator and a TV. A TV and a refrigerator inside their inside their um, inside their room, a microwave. But then they have a, a regular common shower area mm -hmm. on e on each floor. So it gives them they can have their own space, but they're still living in a communal area where they can go and have where they can go and do things. And um, and they're not alone. Exactly, yeah. they're not alone. And the great thing about that also is it gives them their privacy, but they've got the opportunity to go spend time together. But each dorm room is going to have a number on it. reason for that is a lot of these guys have trouble finding a job or anything because they don't have a residence. Wow, I so see it. So they yeah. use our residence and then... Apartment one, yeah. apartment two, Brilliant. apartment three, and so on and so forth. Brilliant. Now they have a place that they can get, and we'll, have, we'll actually have a mailbox. Mm -hmm. All the mail will come to our facility. We'll actually have a mailbox where they can go check their mail. Yeah. Well, you know what else, too? Gosh, it's so funny you should say this because so many people are, you know, and I've said this for a while now. We have been saying for so long, well, the vet, the vet can't uh, get back into society. The vet, that's why I call my company Decompression Dynamics. They, they all say that, you know, it's about them decompressing, mm -hmm. them coming back into society. Well, a lot of this, the truth of the matter is society's not letting them in. Society's not making room for them to reintegrate. And we got to admit to this once and for all. We, we've been through the story. We've been through the story, and it, and it rooted itself like an, like an ugly beast back in the Vietnam War era. And it's not changed. And, and I've got so much to, to talk on that on, a, on another time. I see it in my classrooms. I see it. I see the, the, the outnumbering of the veteran student and how they're, they're just pushed away. And, and, and it's just amazing. And despite whatever other people say, uh, it's, it's not the case. And my point is, is that society's not making room. And I know that a lot of these um, families that have, you've got your veteran, um, you know, that has served, and then this family, they, they try to get into the mainstream. They, they try to get a house together or what have you. The kids are trying to go to high school or what have you. And they get knocked down everywhere mm -hmm. just, to, just to apply to get accepted for a home. I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's a $40 minimum credit check mm -hmm. for two people. That's 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. If, you're, if you have an 18-year-old child in that family, they now have to do a credit check. So that could be three people. Mm -hmm. Just at two people, a husband and a wife, non-refundable, goes to the same Texas, uh, Texas Association of Realtors. Same place. They run the same numbers. They, off, they owe you no answers. A family can go try to get four houses. They have to spend that money up front. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, uh, either cash or cashier's check. They offer you no answer, just a no. Mm -hmm. uh, same place, again. Uh, I'm actually in that position right now because I'm having to move out of my apartment. And I live in McKinney right now, and yeah. I'm having to move out of my apartment and move to a little bit closer to work because I work in Dallas. And, yeah, I mean. Well, there you go. And then they'll say, well, you'll even ask them ahead of time. And I've been moving myself. I'm a single income and so forth. And I don't have a whole lot of income. It's the same thing. I'll say, hey, you know, can you let me know if you if you think that you know this is a viable option for me to get this house or whatever? Hey, it doesn't hurt to try. Just go ahead and and and, and you know apply anyway. So you pay out your money, mm -hmm. and then they found another couple that's a double income and they got plenty of money or whatever. They'd rather rent to them or sell to them, and then they just call you and tell you no. But you've already paid your credit check. They, they offer you nothing, right? So the couple say, or the family is out all that money, and that's absurd. Then it comes down to the credit check. 
Mm -hmm. If you're not the perfect number or they have, say, eight applicants in front of them and they have a perfect score or three perfect scores and you're not as high because maybe your life circumstances, just your circumstances, your number is dinged and you're not as high as them, then you're basically told, yeah, we're not bothered with you. You, you head on your way, right? And, and so it's the same thing. And you know what I'm thinking here? This is what I'm thinking. In your story here, you get to become the landlord. You, the get, you get to be a, the person that takes that call and says, yes, I'll vouch for them, for mm -hmm. that person in room two. Exactly. They're great. Now look at the first, look into the programs that we offer our veterans. What's the first one? Debt management and credit repair. Awesome. I love it. And resume building workshops, job skills training, job placement assistance, substance abuse, counseling, family counseling, money management and budgeting classes, family activities and community events, housing assistance, GED and educational assistance, group activities, team building exercises, and equine therapy. Oh, that is awesome. Dude, I love it. These are all You have things... thought this out brilliantly. Okay, so David, um, yes, so what we're talking about are families, right? Yes. And we're talking about how um, the disruption of these families and how people just in general are trying to fit up, fit fit in and, and, and make it and and just moving from house to house and 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 the real estate and the credit reports and just everything it just has so much power and weight over people trying to make it. And you know, you and I were talking about the importance of music and mm -hmm. how how it just it, it just says so much. It's oh, healing, yeah. it's healing, it, it speaks and and you know just just in the recent shootings, you know, lately, I, you know, I, I teach college and I mean, that's, that's a new battleground now, you know, in the classroom. And um, something that it struck me was the, the song uh, Pearl Jam, the song Jeremy. And I was thinking about that and um, that song by Pearl Jam and it says, uh, part of the song lyrics is, uh, clearly I remember picking on the boy and, and they say, uh, Jeremy spoke, oh yes he did, you know, he spoke. And uh, it, it really talks about how uh, the, the, the youth are, are trying to speak. And I mean, I'm not speaking about what happened in Florida either way or another. But clearly, there's just this, this, this breaking point that is occurring in, in spotty areas of, of pain, of just pain. And, and families are just broken period. And, um, and I asked you, I said, Hey, if you're going to come to the show, you got to bring me a song, you know, what's your song and, and, and what is it? And I, I was impressed that you knew instantly what it was. And so what is it? What's your song? The song that sim that represents us best is a song by five finger death punch. Now I'm a country boy. So for me to like this song, that says a lot. Okay. Um, it's called the wrong side of heaven. And if you've ever seen the video, the entire video is about homeless veterans. And the song speaks wholeheartedly to me and very powerfully to me because I'm going to read just a little bit of it here. I'm not defending, downward descending, falling further and further away, getting closer every day. I'm getting closer every day to the end, to the end and the end of the end. I'm getting closer every day. Wow. Talking about the depression. Arms wide open, I stand alone. I'm no hero, and I'm not made of stone. Right or wrong, I can hardly tell. I'm on the wrong side of heaven and the righteous side of hell. I'm on the wrong side of heaven, the righteous side of hell. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, it's a great band, too. And they're veterans. Right. And, yeah. and I really believe this. I really believe that. I think we've been, we've been gearing up for all these decades. We're saying, you know, the veteran has to readjust. The veteran has to find their way in. But that's not what I see. That's not what I've seen in 26 years. I have a sampling of society in my classrooms. I see society. On the very first day of every semester, I can literally look on a room full of new people that I've never met, and I can go him, 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 and her, and I know who my veterans are. I know. They're sitting straight. Their hygiene is far greater than others. 
No, <laughs> he's touching his beard. And <laughs> There's a reason um, behind the beard. No, no, but uh, uh, they, th- yes, ma'am. Uh, their books are bought and out, and their their pencils are straight, and they are they have an excitement about. We ready hold ourselves to, to a higher standard. Right, and 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 they are ostracized. They are the the masses sit away from them physically, as if. Uh, they are afraid. Yeah. Now, now, if if they tend to be a fairly good-looking physical type of of gentleman or female, on the first few weeks, they've got interest, right, by the opposite sex. Um, but after a few weeks that go by, if they still look like they've got that that wall up of that military stance even the opposite sex kind of veer away from them like strange odd duck you are and they rejoin the masses it's a Mm -hmm. very intriguing uh social scene um they hang on so long and then they begin to disappear uh i have a missed glass and then a couple more missed and then they're gone uh, retention drops, and then they disappear, and mm-hmm. then they become part of your statistics. Mm-hmm. It is a troubling trend. Uh, it, I've seen it for over 26 years. So when people tell me, and they tell me all the time, and this is, an, again, why I've created this scenario for these discussions, is because they must be had. When people keep telling me the veteran must readjust, it is not true. The veteran has made his attempt or her attempt. I've seen it, and they're constantly trying. They're exhausted trying. The society is not letting them in. The this you know Texas Association of Realtors they will tell you you know they'll take you around in their fancy car these families they will have you you know do another credit report and give another check uh, to to see if you can get this house and the children are saying yes I want that room I can't believe we can get this house can we please and then they have to tell them no again and you said it earlier you said the word yourself and you used your own self as the example. You said something in regards to, I'll just, you know, take my life and not be a burden. And I'm thinking, I don't know, but I'm thinking that that's mostly the reason why the suicide. I think most believe if I go, then I can cut them loose. Mm -hmm. My wife and my children, people will come to their aid There'll be monies or family will finally come and help the children and my wife or what have you, and they'll make it, and me, the burden, will be removed from the problem, and I will actually somehow sacrifice this problem, and that has got to end. I couldn't because agree more. society won't bend anymore, and th- there isn't this, this you know, uh, what do you call it, the... When they came back from war, of course, there was the... Um, the stand-downs? Well, no, the, 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 the military housing, right? Where they, they came and they stayed on, on the military housing. Well, now they don't, even, they don't even have that as an option, nor should they be contained to that anyway, right? But, but that's not even an option. They come straight in to say North. They come to McKinney. They come to Frisco. They come to live amongst the rest of us, and they should be entitled to everything we have. By the way, I saw on a credit report for a rental property, it's, it's a standard residential sheet that everybody signs when you hand them that $40 whatever per applicant. It says on there, um, are you, what does it say? It says, are you or um, a spouse, even if being separated, are you under orders that would restrict you to a one-year lease? You need to look at that. Mm-hmm. It's basically saying, uh, if you there's a chance that you're going to be restricted to a one-year lease, we have a right to say, yeah, no, maybe not. Uh, we're going to go with someone else. We want to rent to somebody that's going to stay longer. You might want to look into that. It's judgmental. Yeah, that shouldn't have, that shouldn't be. Mm-mm. And it says even if you're separating, what does that mean? 
I don't know what that means. I think you need to look at that. It means that they're worried more about the bottom line than they are trying to take care of people. It's all about money. Right. Right. So so you take a vet, right, that has to take his kid, and these children want to go to a, a high school or be with their friends like anybody else and get a cell phone like anybody else, and he's got to go back or she's got to go back to their family and say, yeah, we can't. We, we got denied this house again. We got denied this house again. Can't move here. Can't move here. And then if you end up homeless, can, I can't imagine being homeless with three children. It's or tough. two children. I, or, I see it all the time in some of the shelters. I mean... And it really breaks my heart seeing the kids in the shelters, you know, because they're getting to see a harsh side of society that I don't believe any child should ever have to endure. You know, I don't... And I study national security. I study long term. Like, what's tomorrow? What's the recruit of tomorrow? What's what's our threat tomorrow? Are we ready to face it? How do we prepare for that? Where's the heroes gone? This these are our heroes. Is this how we view our heroes? If the child can't even look up to dad and go, Dad, you're my hero. We're living in a we're living in a shelter. If we can't correct that. Then where does the recruit come for tomorrow? I, where does the, where does protect and home come from tomorrow? We have a national security need here. You we we have to readjust this in in every capacity. This is a national security issue beyond a moral and ethical thing that is so out of control that we should be ashamed of ourselves. I couldn't agree more. You know, what are we showing the younger generation? What kind of lessons are we teaching them? Exactly. You know, the children are the future, and they're the leaders of tomorrow. But what are we showing them, really, at this point? Exactly. And I wonder, I really wonder if these if these individuals are taking themselves out even to save their dignity from their own children. I, I know that sounds weird, right? <laughs> I know that sounds weird. The, sort of cutting a cord in a way to, to prolong this whatever this is. This 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 legacy of, of of sadness and despair that they probably feel in some regard that they've created, but they and haven't created. And if anybody's listening, you haven't created this. And see, that's that's the message. You haven't created this, and that's not the solution to solve it. We're we have to solve this for you. And that's why, that's part of the reason I created this organization with my partners you know that's why we created we got your six to try and help those that we can mm -hmm. that's why our, our slogan is where no veteran stands alone right and we gotta have we gotta have those that are in this type of bind we need you to hang in there man we need you to hang in there there's hope there is hope you can't quit on us because if you quit on us, we don't have our army for later to, 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 to watch the house, to protect the house. Um, we got to have you up and ready to go. Uh, you're the best we got. You're the best we've got. And when you think about my, you know, what I'm talking about in, in the, the grander scheme, you know, you can't disappear on us. You can't leave us. We, you know, it's our job to 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 get this right, and, and we're working tirelessly. Um, if you haven't heard from David here, <laughs> you got somebody that's it's. He came in on braces today. He ran to the okay. This guy ran to the VA this morning and sat in front of the VA before they opened at 8 a.m. to get braces put on his knees hobbled in here with new braces that he's never had before on crutches 
and met me here and PM'd me every little bit. I hope you were actually stopped at stoplights. I was. Okay, yes, yeah. I was stopped at stoplights. I'm almost there. Met me here to get here to get on this microphone because he wasn't going to miss this opportunity to promote what he's doing because he's that passionate, him and his partner both, and everyone else associated with what he does because he's that in the fight. And um, this is a genuine deal. And um, it, he's been there. And, and I've been there. I've been to the point of killing myself. Lost all hope. It took one person to give me an opportunity to turn my life around. And I want anybody listening to know that you're not alone in this fight. You have a group of people out here and a group of supporters behind us that want to be your strength, that want to be your motivation, they want to be that stepping stone that you need to get your life back on track, to take care of not only yourself, but take care of your families and show society that you may have been homeless at one point, but nobody is a worthless individual. You know, we have people coming to our country all the time for the freedoms and liberties that the United States is known for. Liberties that we helped fight to give this country. And I want you to know that your lives matter and that I will fight until I don't have a breath left in me to make sure that We Got Your Six gets up and going and strong and powerful to provide you guys what you need. We need the community involvement. You know, we've got f fundraisers coming up from now until October. We need volunteers. We, can e we need donations. Show the homeless veterans that you still believe in them. Show the homeless veterans that you still support the military, that you still appreciate their commitment to what they did. Let them know that you've got their six like we do. This is a letter that was written by one of my students. Um, I gave them some opportunities to write some letters and they wrote this, a letter to a veteran. Dear veteran, I will forever be grateful for your service. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know that those are two simple words that will never be able to show the amount of gratitude I have for you. You are the real hero. What you have done for us in this country should come before anything else. Your dedication should be rewarded in much more ways than they are. You should be above any celebrity and be idolized over any superhero. Not many people see what you gave up as one single person to defend a nation. You gave up countless hours and days, sometimes even years, away from your friends and family to protect me, my family, and the whole country. You worked night and day to protect us so I could sleep safely in my bed at night. Because of you, I am able to wake up in the greatest country on earth and live freely as I please. Many of my peers take the freedoms we have that you fought countless hours to protect for granted. On behalf of them, I would like to take a moment and apologize for their inconsiderate, unappreciative actions. I am sorry that people in this country do not show you the gratitude and respect that you deserve. I am sorry that some of my peers choose to kneel on the ground during the national anthem. I am sorry that they think it is a form of protest and their freedom of speech when a reality is that nothing but disgrace and shows how truly ungrateful they are. I am sorry that you have to witness selfish and ungrateful individuals burning the flag that you protected with your life. Not only is it my peers that owe you a huge apology, it is the country as a whole. Like I stated in the beginning, you should come before any, before anything of this country puts first. 
I am sorry on behalf of the country that you do not have the health care that you deserve or the support in different aspects of life that you need when you return home. I am sorry that this country puts immigrants and refugees before their own veterans that fought so hard for them to work in the government they love so dearly. I am sorry. I am proud that our soldiers, Army, Marines, and Airmen who fought in the world's wars, all of them, every war, every single one. Now we have new situations of protecting our borders, every, every piece, home and abroad. I am confident that every citizen in America is secure and protected, even though it's not easy. I am confident that every youngster in this nation does not have to stand up by, by necessity because you volunteer. We owe you and we thank you. You are a role model. We will always remember your great volunteerism and the fact that you signed that blank check by choice. Thank you for, tech, for protecting the United States of America. I will forever be grateful. Sincerely, college student. That's amazing. I have a stack of these. That is a amazing. A stack of these. And I had told them, my students, all of my classes that I needed them to do an extra assignment because they hadn't done enough writing this semester and that they needed to work on their English and they weren't doing, you know, and I needed to get an extra assignment. So um, I said, yeah, um, I just kind of wanted to see their feelings when they were having the walkouts, you know, after the shooting that had occurred in Florida. So I said, I'll tell you what, I said, you can write some letters because I just wanted them to get the, the, you know, the exercise of writing. So I gave them choices and they could write, uh, dear veteran, dear president of the United States of America, dear Congress, dear, um, dear the United States flag. They could write to the flag. <laughs> they could write to the Texas flag and, oh my gosh. And I'm going to, I'm going to get through them on the show and, and, and read them, uh, along the way. Some of them are phenomenal. And they are not in agreement with the protests. They are not in agreement with the walkouts. They are the opposite, and they are beautiful, truly beautiful. And they wrote for no other reason but to just talk about how they felt. They didn't. They weren't going for anything of of you know getting out there on the radio or anything. They just talked from their heart. And I have a stack of them. They're That's amazing. amazing. Yeah. So, uh, but, but the media, the, the mainstream media, that's not what they're portraying, and, and that's what I don't understand. And, and a, the, another reason for wanting to do this, I, I want their voices to be heard because that's not the voice that's being heard out when we get on Facebook or, or anything else. That's not the voice we hear. We hear otherwise, and I'm tired of that. I'm very much tired of that. Um, and they, those voices, are in the minority of that mass population I'm talking about. It, I, maybe I didn't describe it very well. You have a mass population in that scenario of what I call the classroom, of course. What I mean is you have, say, 50 people, right? And then that's a mass population. You have a very minute group of that. So out of 50, you may have four veterans. And so they're the ostracized sort of disconnected of course but in that 50 maybe you know you still have a, a, a large grouping of this type of letter writer but they have become silent it's because um, they're afraid to be criticized you know right, they're, right. They're, they're they're afraid to voice their opinions because they're afraid what their peers are going to think. Right. They don't. They don't raise their hands anymore. They yeah. don't talk up anymore. Um, they are. They're silently sort of bullied. Like, oh, you know, there's that kid again talking. That they. They're just. It's a dynamic that's just shifted, and and it's it's a sad scenario. But they're writing in. They're 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 speaking now through writing like this. 
And I'm like, there they are, there they are. They're, they're writing it to me. Um, I, and I, cause I was like, where did you all go? Where did y'all go? And so, but they needed I, inspiration. Well, I found it in their writings and that's why I, I protect this folder. Uh, uh, thank with you for pride. sharing that letter. I mean, You're that's, welcome. That's an amazing letter. And You're welcome. whoever wrote that should be very proud of what they, of yeah. what they said. And, uh, and you know, they, they hit one, they hit one key thing in here that really, really um, hit me when you read it, was the fact that we do sign a blank check. You know, we do sign a blank check when we join the military, up to including our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these guys come back here and go through whatever the struggles they go through. See, life, when we're overseas fighting, life back here kind of stops for us. But the families here have to keep going on. So the veteran comes, the military person comes back from war and things have moved on. Right. They're having to reintegrate in not only to, into society, but they're having to reintegrate into their families. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's not easy. Some people come back, some people come back easier than others. But that's some of the reasons that some of these guys end up homeless. You know, I've had people ask me, "Well, what's the main piece of people re reason to end up homeless?" I said, "There is no clear one reason. It's different for every veteran." Some people get hooked on drugs. Some people get hooked on alcohol. Some people come home, their families have kicked them out of the house and moved in a boyfriend or something. Mm -hmm. There is no one reason. That's right. But there is one solution. Society and the communities coming together yeah. to put an end to it. Yeah. Society's got to make their make way for them. They have to. they got to teach their children and their grandchildren how to do it. Role models. Mm -hmm. Families have to be led right. And the role models have to teach them how it's done. It's so important. David, I hate to tell you this. We're almost out of time. Okay. What I want you to do is tell us about your upcoming events. I've got one last thing to end with. And it's been great. And you are going to come back because we've got work to do, dude. <laughs> I'd be more than happy <laughs> it's to. It's been great. So May 19th, I have my second annual Armed Forces Day bowling event at Strikes Bowling Alley. And speaking of Strikes Bowling Alley, they're huge supporters of the military. I can't give them a big shout out enough, but we are actually launching our own bowling league. So you don't have to be good at bowling. You're bowling. You're coming out. You're bowling, and you're raising money for a good cause. And you're helping support homeless veterans, and you're helping support the military. July fifteenth, we have, or excuse me, July fourteenth at Southern Junction in Irving, Texas, we have a red, white, and brew poker tournament <laughs> that's awesome now this world this is a world series of poker sanctioned event so whoever wins my tournament gets a seat at the regional event in frisco in 2019 february of 2019 whoever wins that one gets a seat at the world series of poker in vegas so all that information is going to be coming on my website so pay attention october i have a chili cook-off Again, taking place in, a, in Southern Junction in Irving. Don't have the date for that yet. I'm waiting for the football schedule because we're going to do it on an away game and have it on the big 80-inch plasma TV screen. And I'm actually participating in September 20th and 21st. I'm taking part in the Karen Mercy's Golf Gala. And I am looking for silent auction items and raffle items for all of these events. As well as I still need sponsors for the golf gala. So if any business owners are interested in getting your name out there and supporting the Care and Mercy Foundation and special needs children as well as military causes, just go to my website, www.wgy6.org. You can email me at davidjordan at wgy6.org. Or you can call me at 859-469-1816. Give me a call or a text. I'll be more than happy to share any other information with you. That sounds great. I appreciate this so much. No, thank Anything you so much. Anything else you want to add, though? Anything else? Actually, I do. I want to thank you. No. You know, you've, no, no. You know right. you've been following me on Facebook for a while, and you've, you know, we've talked about a few of the things, and we've shared some things over Facebook. 
And I want to thank you for, you know, giving me the opportunity to be your very first guest. Oh, you are. I was so excited. You know, You're so welcome. I'm, I'm you know honored. Like about, no, no, no. But thank you. You know what? You know what I like about you? You're real, dude. <laughs> you know what I like about that? No, there's no glamour. Uh, you're never you're never doing the the fancy selfies you're you're real and, and that's what i've noticed about your whole organization and every and, and and kudos to everyone else that supports you all your volunteers every event that i notice it's it's you're not posing ever about look at me look at me ever you're always about your cause and the people you love who you serve it's real and now that i've gotten to know you more it, I, I understand even more about what you're doing. Um, it, I take I take my I take a few selfies in front of my banner. Well, you know, you know what I mean. But I mean, it's not about you. No, it's and, not. And and if it's about you, it's about you're saying I'm real and and come yeah. join me. Uh, we got we, like almost like hey, get out here and roll up your sleeves and get dirty with us and let's get this done. You know, you I know? didn't. We didn't. We, James, Angie, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention James Lopez or Angie Messerly, my two partners. We didn't start this organization because we wanted to get famous or because we wanted to get rich. We want to stop the veteran, the veteran homelessness problem. We want to stop the suicides, and we want to give people hope. And that's what the whole—that's what this organization is about. I don't care if you know, I don't care to get rich off of it. I care to bring to light the suicide rates yeah. and the homeless veteran problem. I can't tell you how many people say, "Hey, I didn't even know the problem was that bad." That's why we do what we do. And it's so obvious. You know what I did one day and it freaked me out. It was just a it was just a random thing. I was a little upset that my students just were at one point very complacent and a little entitled about the attitude about the suicide issue. So I said, "All right, let's count off. We're going to count off." And it wasn't here or anything, you know, in my current classes. It was last year. And I said, "All right, we're going to count off." So we counted off 22 people. And I said, you know, one, two, three, whatever went through. And then at that time, we'd lost some first responders, too. We lost about nine in about mm. six days or so. So we counted off them, too. And I stood back. It's like, all right, theoretically, the classroom is empty. The classroom is empty. And we all kind of looked around. Everybody was a little shocked, especially me. And I said, so that's non-sustainable. That's non-sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, all right, so we're all wiped out, right? We're all gone. We keep that up long term. Go back to national security, that's an issue. Yeah, exactly. And so that really, really made me do some thinking. That really made me do some thinking. So, um, you know, and I just love it, the fact that, that you guys are real. Um, this isn't about anything beyond the fact that, that this is a real, true mission, and, and I support you 100%. You let me know whatever I can do. Well, this was a huge help. I can't thank you enough. I hope so. I hope so. Well, so. I got to tell you, I'm, I, I, t when I walked into the library this morning, I got to say, the sun was not even all the way up. It was early. And um, across the, the concrete, I think you saw it, there was um, chalk everywhere mm -hmm. to honor National Poetry Month. And I am no poet. <laughs> so I sat down to reflect on my feelings. And this is because I was very taken aback by the fact we had our inaugural show happening. You were coming out to talk about what we were going to be talking about. And I saw so much activity at sunrise by uh, students that were going in the right direction, the type we're really believing in that don't get highlighted. So this was my ridiculous attempt at poetry for National Poetry Month, okay? This is what I write. Again, I'm no good at this. I write, walk in the doors, shuffle, shuffle. I hear the movement of feet. Walk through the second set of doors. Slam, slam as the cool morning breeze secures the close of the outer world to the other. Before the sun fully rises, quiet, purposeful movement among the floors, focused reflection upon computer screens, open books, and audio recordings from headphones. Can joy be seen on a seriously focused mind entering the library's limitless halls and pathways to wonder, adventure, theories, and solutions? Why, yes! Why do you think I am here? With that, we want to thank you. We hope you join us again. Have a blessed, blessed day, everyone. Look up David Jordan. What's your email? Not your email. Your website address one more time. www.
dot W-G-Y, the number six, dot O-R-G. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much, sir.